Mathematics has a rule. If you want an answer, you solve the equation. But in the 20th century, that rule broke. Equations became unsolvable. Calculations collapsed under their own weight. Yet one number kept appearing, unchanged, no matter how the equation was bent. Then came the question, what if the answer isn't in the equation at all? What if it's written into the shape of space? That idea didn't just solve a problem. It rewrote mathematics. It predicted physics. And it taught us something unsettling. This is the story of Michael Atiyah, the mathematician who taught equations when to stay silent. Before the theorems, before the prizes, before mathematics learned how to speak the language of physics, there was a child born into a world already fractured. On April 22, 1929, in London, just months before the global economy collapsed and the 20th century lurched toward chaos, Michael Francis Atiyah entered the world. It was a world defined by borders, empires and uncertainty. But from the very beginning, Atiyah's life would refuse to stay within borders. Michael Atiyah's father, Edward Atiyah, was a senior civil servant in the British colonial administration. He came from a Lebanese Christian family, rooted in the Middle East, but working within the machinery of the British Empire. His mother, Jean Atiyah, was British. From the start, Atiyah belonged to more than one world, East and West, Empire and Periphery, tradition and transition. Michael Atiyah did not grow up in one place. Because of his father's work, his childhood unfolded across Sudan and Egypt, regions shaped by colonial rule and political change. These were not static landscapes. They were societies in motion, languages overlapping, cultures intersecting, identities constantly negotiated. For a child, this kind of life does something subtle but profound. It teaches you that the world is not fixed, that the same truth can look different depending on where you stand. That understanding comes not from staying still, but from connecting perspectives. In a life defined by movement, mathematics became a constant. British-style schooling abroad emphasized discipline, logic, and structure. And within that structure, Atiyah found something universal. Numbers did not care about geography. Geometry did not change with politics. Proofs held everywhere. Eventually, Atiyah returned to England for his formal education. At Manchester Grammar School, one of Britain's most demanding academic institutions, his talent became unmistakable. Mathematics was no longer just an interest. It was a language he spoke fluently. But even here, he was different. He was not driven by calculation alone. He was drawn to structure, to connections, to the question of how separate ideas might belong to a single underlying system. When Michael Atiyah arrived at Cambridge, mathematics itself was changing. The Second World War had ended, but its intellectual aftershocks were still rippling through the sciences. Old problems no longer seemed sufficient. Mathematicians were searching for structure, deeper frameworks that could explain not just results, but why those results existed at all. For Atiyah, this atmosphere was intoxicating. He moved beyond coursework and into research, drawn toward algebraic geometry, a field concerned with shapes defined not by drawings, but by equations. Under the supervision of William Valance Douglas Hodge, one of the great geometers of the 20th century, Atiyah began his doctoral work. Atiyah earned his PhD in 1955, but the thesis itself was not the destination. Under Hodge's influence, Atiyah learned to think geometrically, to see mathematics not as a collection of tricks, but as a landscape of interconnected ideas. Algebraic geometry was his training ground, but it was never meant to be his final home. Even then, 
he was asking larger questions. What lies beneath these structures? What connects geometry to topology and topology to analysis? He was less interested in mastering a field than in understanding how fields fit together. Soon after completing his doctorate, Atiyah crossed the Atlantic to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. This was not just a change of location, it was a transformation of perspective. Princeton was a meeting point for the world's most ambitious mathematical minds. Here, abstraction ruled. Boundaries between disciplines were thinner. Conversations moved freely between topology, geometry, and analysis. For Atiyah, this was confirmation. The future of mathematics would not belong to specialists working in isolation. It would belong to those who could move between ideas and unify them. When Atiyah returned to England, first to Cambridge and then to Oxford, he was no longer simply a promising young mathematician. He was becoming an independent thinker. His early work focused on vector bundles, mathematical objects that describe how local data fits together globally. To many, these were technical tools. To Atiyah, they were conceptual bridges. Vector bundles linked geometry to topology, local behavior to global structure, analysis to shape. Quietly, the foundations of something much larger were taking form. Atiyah did not work alone. He believed mathematics advanced fastest through conversation, through the collision of perspectives. During this time, he began forming collaborations that would define his career. And then, in the early 1960s, one encounter changed everything. Atia met Isadora Singer. Singer spoke the language of analysis. Atia spoke the language of geometry and topology. They were fluent in different dialects of mathematics. But they were about to ask the same question, and when those two languages collided, mathematics would never be the same again. By the late 1950s, mathematics faced a quiet crisis. Analysts studied elliptic differential operators, equations that describe heat flow, wave propagation, and quantum particles. These operators governed the behavior of physical systems, yet solving them directly was often impossible. Even worse, the most important quantity, their index, the difference between the number of solutions and constraints, seemed to depend on infinite, fragile calculations. At the same time, topologists studied shapes, not equations, but spaces, holes, twists, curvature. Their tools were crude but powerful, invariants that did not change no matter how violently a shape was bent, as long as it wasn't torn. Two worlds existed side by side. Analysis asked, what are the solutions? Topology asked, what must remain true, no matter what? No one believed these questions belonged together. Michael Atiyah did. Atiyah's radical insight was simple to state and almost absurd to accept. What if the index of an elliptic operator, an analytical quantity defined by infinite dimensional spaces, was actually determined by pure topology? What if the number of solutions to an equation could be computed without solving the equation at all? This was not approximation, this was equivalence. Local behavior versus global structure, analysis versus topology, two languages describing the same truth. This idea would become index theory. Working with Isidore Singer, Atiyah formalized the impossible. The Atiyah-Singer index theorem states that the analytic index of an elliptic differential operator, defined using functional analysis, is equal to a topological index computed using characteristic classes of vector bundles over the underlying manifold. In plain terms, take an equation defined locally, point by point, ignore the equation, study the shape of the space instead, the answer will be the same. To mathematicians, this was shocking. It meant that centuries of analytical problems, from the Gauss-Bonnet theorem to the Riemann-Roch theorem, were not isolated miracles, but shadows of a single unifying principle. What appeared unrelated was suddenly inevitable. The theorem collapsed distinctions that had structured mathematics for generations. 
computation versus structure. The proof itself introduced new machinery, K-theory, characteristic classes, and sophisticated geometric constructions. But the deeper impact was philosophical. Mathematics was not a collection of techniques. It was a coherent system. To make index theory work, Atiyah needed a new language. That language was K-theory. Instead of studying individual vector bundles, objects that describe how data varies over space, K-theory grouped them into equivalence classes. Differences mattered more than absolutes. Structure replaced clutter. K-theory transformed complicated geometric problems into algebraic ones that could actually be computed. Then physics arrived, with questions mathematics could no longer ignore. In quantum field theory, physicists encountered anomalies, quantities that vanished locally but appeared globally. Calculations worked, until they didn't. Gauge theory, particularly Yang-Mills theory, depended on connections on vector bundles, exactly the structures Atiyah had been studying. Solutions called instantons appeared, objects defined not by equations alone, but by topology. Physicists needed to know, why do these solutions exist? Why are there exactly this many? Why are some quantities conserved no matter what? Index theory answered all of it. By the 1960s, Michael Atiyah had reached the summit of academic mathematics. He became civilian professor of geometry at Oxford, a position once held by the architects of classical geometry. Later, he moved fluidly between the world's most powerful institutions, Oxford, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and back again. But authority never hardened him. Even as his influence grew, Atiyah remained something rare, a leader without distance, a mathematician who governed not by command, but by ideas. In the 1990s, Atiyah turned from individual discovery to collective creation. He became the founding director of the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Cambridge. The vision was radical. Bring mathematicians and physicists together for months at a time, long enough for genuine understanding to emerge. No silos, no rushing, just ideas colliding. The institute quickly became one of the most important mathematical centers in the world, not because of its prestige, but because of its structure. Atiyah was shaping environments the same way he shaped mathematics, by designing spaces where unity could happen. Atiyah's influence extended beyond mathematics. As president of the Royal Society, he became the public face of British science itself. He advised governments, shaped funding priorities, and argued relentlessly for the value of fundamental research. Work driven not by immediate application, but by curiosity. He understood something policymakers often forget. Breakthroughs do not come from prediction, they come from freedom. And mathematics, in his view, was the purest expression of that freedom. The world recognized Atiyah's impact. The Fields Medal honored his early brilliance. The Copley Medal acknowledged a lifetime of influence. And in 2004, the Abel Prize, shared with Isidore Singer, recognized the Atiyah Singer Index Theorem as one of the defining achievements of modern mathematics. But Atiyah never spoke of prizes as endpoints. To him, they were signals, not of completion, but of responsibility. Proof that ideas mattered, and therefore, that they must be shared. Atiyah's books and papers did more than record results. They taught a way of thinking. K-theory became a gateway for generations of students. His papers, precise, spare and conceptually bold, remained readable decades after publication, not because they were simple, but because they were structured. Even today, his work forms the backbone of graduate courses in topology, geometry and mathematical physics. Not as history, as foundation. Despite his stature, Atiyah was remembered most vividly, not for his authority, but for his generosity. He listened, he encouraged, he mentored without possession. 
young mathematicians found in him not a gatekeeper, but an ally, someone who cared less about credit than about coherence, less about ownership than about understanding. He believed collaboration was not a convenience, but a necessity, because no single mind, no matter how brilliant, could see the whole structure alone. In his later years, Atiyah spoke increasingly about the nature of mathematics itself. He rejected the idea that mathematics was mechanical, or purely logical, or detached from humanity. For him, mathematics was creative, intuitive, beautiful, a way of revealing deep order beneath apparent complexity. Not fragmentation, but unity. Michael Atiyah died in 2019, but his work did not end. The paradox we began with, the equation solved without solving, was never really about equations. It was about perspective, because in the end, Atiyah showed us something profound, that beneath the chaos of the world, there is structure, and learning to see it changes everything.